so the, now the live streaming is on so i'm going to um, enable the uh,
which is can you take over from here can i start yeah i think that is two minutes you can announce you can uh, uh, talk about the upcoming event and then after that seven o'clock we can start okay A very warm welcome to one and all gathered here. To give the satsang an auspicious start, I welcome Padmini Ji for the invocation prayers. But before Padmini Ji could come for the prayers, let me first announce the um, Gita Jayanti um, program, which is which began as a simple parayan several years ago and has now become a hub of several activities associated with the Gita. 2022 marks the Silver Jubilee celebrations for Gita Jayanti Singapore. And to make the celebrations special, they have organized Swami Sarvapriyananda Ji's talks in four installments, one in each quarter. This is the second of the lecture series. The online session for the third quarter of the lecture series is scheduled on Saturday, 3rd September, 2022. Today, we will be listening to the second lecture of the lecture series. Um, now, I think I will hand over to Padmini Ji for the invocation prayers. Oh. Shuklam Baradharam Vishnum, Shashi Varnam Chatur Bhujam, Rasan Navadanam Dhyayet, Sarva Vigno Pashantaye, Sadashiva Samaram Bham, Shankaracharya Madhyamam, Asmadacharya Paryantam, Vande Guru Param Param, Saraswati Namastubhyam, Varade Kamarupini, Vidyarambham Karishyami Siddhir Bhavatume Sada Om Sahana Bhavatu Sahana Obhunatu Sahaviryam Karavavahai Tejasvi Navadhi Tamas Tuma Vidpishavahai Om Shanti 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 Atha Srimad Bhagavad Gita Dhyanam Om Parthaya Pratibodhitam Bhagavata Narayane Naswayam Vyasena Gratitam Purana Munina Madhye Mahabharatam Advaitam Ritavarshinim Bhagavatim Ashtadashadhyayini Ambatwa Manusandadhami Bhagavad Gite Bhavadveshini Namostute Vyasa Vishala Buddhe Kullara Vinda Yatapatra Netra Yenatvaya Bharata Taila Purnaha Prajwali Tognana Maya Pradipa Prapanna Parijataya Totra Vetraika Panaye, Yana Mudraya Krishnaya, Gita Mrita Duhe Namaha, Sarvo Panisha Dogavaha, Dogdago Palanandanaha, Parthovatsa Studir Bhokta, Dukham Gita Mritam Mahat, Vasude Vasutam Devam, Kamsachanura Mardanam, Devaki Paramanandam Krishnam Vande Jagadgurum 
मूकं करोति वाचालं पंगुं लंघयते गिरिं यत्कृपा तमहं वन्दे परमानंद माधवं यम ब्रह्मा वरुणेन्द्र रुद्र मरुतः सुन्वन्ति दिव्यै स्तवैः वेदै सांग पद क्रमो पनिषदैः गायन्ति यम सामगाः ध्यानावस्थित तद्गतेन मनसा पश्यन्ति यम योगिनः यस्यान्तं न विदुसुरा सुरगणाः देवाय तस्मै नमः Thank you, Padmini Ji. Gita Jayanti Singapore began with a simple parayan several years ago and has now become a hub of several activities associated with the Gita. In the process, several organizations have come together, increasing the numbers involved. This has made Gita Jayanti something unique. 2022 marks the silver jubilee celebrations for Geeta Jayanti Singapore to make the celebrations special they have organized swami sarvapriyananda ji stock in four installments one in each quarter this is the second of the lecture series swami sarvapriyananda ji is currently the spiritual leader of the vedanta society of new york he is very well known for his simple convincing language to communicate with clarity the profound teachings of the advaita vedanta philosophy based on traditional methods his talks attract young and adult minds alike which makes him one of the most sought after teachers a very warm welcome to you swami ji a hearty welcome to the chairman of hindu endowments board shri jayachandran ji chairman of hindu advisory board shri rajan krishnan ji CEO Hindu Endowments Board Sri Rajasekhar ji chairman Geeta Jayanti committee Sri Srinivasan ji and the heads of participating organizations of Geeta Jayanti and their other representatives all other distinguished guests guests and the audience spanning across the globe from Australia to USA without any further delay i hand over to swami ji वसुदेवासुत देव कंसचाणोरमर्दनम देवकी परमानंदम कृष्ण वंदे जगद्गु नमस्ते एवरीबडी आई एम थैंक यू एंड ग्रैटिट्यूड टू द गीता जयंती एंड ऑल अदर एसोसिएटेड ऑर्गेनाइजेशन इन सिंगापुर फॉर ऑर्गेनाइजिंग not only this event but a series of events to mark geeta jayanti this year um in the first talk we looked at certain transformative practices from the 13th chapter of the bhagavad gita these are preparatory for um uh, the the core realization which is self realization swami vivekananda when he came to this country to the united states in 1893 in the world parliament religions he stayed back here he taught in different parts of the united states uh, including new york where he came here and founded the vedanta society where i am right now he was very fond of introducing vedanta by these lines from the upanishads shrinvantu vishve amritasya putraha aaye dhamani divyani rastu वेदाहम पुरुषम महांतम आदित्य वर्णम तमस परस्ता तमे विद्वा अति मृत्यु मेति नान्य पंथा विद्यते अयनाय वेरी ब्यूटिफुल लाइन्स फ्रॉम द उपनिषद्स व्हिच मींस व्हिच गिव्स अस द सेंट्रल मैसेज ऑफ वेदांत इट सेज दैट सम ऋषि वी डोंट नो इन एंशिएंट वैदिक टाइम्स डिक्लेअर्स लिसन ये चिल्ड्रन ऑफ इमॉर्टल ब्लेस ये addresses us all as children of immortal bliss even the gods the devatas in heavens you also listen because what i am going to tell you this this message this teaching you do not know what is this teaching vedaham purusham mahantam i have realized that infinite being what is that infinite being like 
ஆதித்ய வர்ணம் பிளேசிங் ஃபோர்த் லைக் த சன் வித் லைட் நாட் ஆஃப் மெட்டீரியல் லைட் பட் லைட் ஆஃப் கான்சியஸ்னஸ் அண்ட் தமஸ் ஆஃப் பரஸ்தார் ஃபார் எவர் பி ஆன் த டார்க்னஸ் ஆஃப் டெத் சாரோ ஹியூமன் லிமிடேஷன் வாட் இஸ் த யூஸ் ஆஃப் ஆஃப் திஸ் ரியலைசேஷன் தமேவ விதித்வா அதி மிருத்யு மேதி when we realize that we go beyond death we go beyond sorrow we go beyond human limitation is there any other way through technology through medicine through entertainment politics anything that we do in life will we be able to attain immortality will we be able to overcome human suffering nanya pantha vidyate ayanaya there is no other way other than this this realization of that infinite reality now to this has to be added that not only this infinite reality is there atman brahman whatever you call it god realization is the goal but vedanta advaita vedanta adds one more unique idea to this like what revered swami ranganathanand ji of, of uh, the ramakrishna mission he was the 13th president visited singapore many times in his uh, lifetime he used to call it vedantic bombshells so what this vedantic bombshell is there is this atman brahman god whatever you call it every religion declares it um but advaita vedanta goes further and says where is this uh, ultimate reality where is brahman it is none other than the atman ourselves our real nature is brahman so god realization is equal to self realization and this is the subject for today to know ourselves to know who or what we are um bhagavad gita this is one book if you want to learn vedanta if somebody says suggest one book we should always suggest bhagavad gita if somebody wants to learn about hinduism one book is bhagavad gita it is the most representative book vast scriptural heritage is there in hinduism but all of that can be found essential message is found in bhagavad gita but what is the essential message of bhagavad gita itself um, some have said it is bhakti devotion to god some have said it is um, total surrender to the lord um, sarva dharman parityajya mam ekam sharanam vraja so shri krishna himself says that give up giving up all other practices uh, devote yourself surrender yourself completely to me some have said it is a call to action different commentators have interpreted in different ways one is a call to action some have said the central message is to do your duty but if you look at the bhagavad gita uh, at the very beginning sri krishna teaches the first teaching of sri krishna is self knowledge is self realization from the second chapter when sri krishna starts speaking the first thing he teaches arjuna is self realization and this must be so gita is a fundamental text of vedanta and therefore the vedantic idea of self realization must be the central message of bhagavad gita yes bhakti is there surrender is there karma is there and all of those are essential as we shall see but first of all what does sri krishna say i should have started with this but the first lecture i gave i went to the 13th chapter picked out certain practices which are preparatory uh, in order to enable us to gain this self knowledge and now we have come back to the beginning of the bhagavad gita second chapter from the 11th verse onwards from the 10th verse onwards sri krishna starts speaking um, till that first chapter was arjuna is telling his problems there is an introduction and then sri krishna starts speaking from the um, and notice that sri krishna starts speaking only when he is asked a question as long as arjuna was going on complaining sri krishna, uh, sri krishna sat quietly in the chariot smiling but when he arjuna said i am your disciple i i have no solution to the problem of life please help me then only the lord started speaking one of our great swami ji's bhaskareshwar anand ji who was a swa- our um, swami ji in nagpur ramakrishna mat in nagpur many many years ago long before my lifetime um, he Uh, would when he would start teaching bhagavad gita he would tell us he would tell the students that remember who is speaking who is the acharya here who is the master the teacher here 
is not a pandit uh, not a scholar not a philosopher not even a sadhu actually none other than bhagavan shri bhagavan himself is speaking so this teaching is coming to us directly from god that is the the reverence the care with which we, we should approach the teachings of the bhagavad gita so from the 10th verse onwards sri krishna starts teaching and the first thing he says very first thing he says to arjuna and arjuna was in sorrow nanu shochanti panditaha the wise ones go beyond sorrow you want a solution to sorrow you need wisdom pandita here means not the pandit we are, we are uh, uh, familiar with nowadays it is a common word in english wall street pandit wall street pandit means expert in stocks and share share market no shankaracharya defines pandita panda panda here means atma vishaya pragya one who has realization of the self so the realization self realization those who have that is pandit and that person uh, he or she they go beyond sorrow if you want to go beyond sorrow go beyond death you have to become a pandit pandit means self realized who am i what am i that we need to know and sri krishna directly proceeds uh, how interesting it is arjuna did not ask for this he did not ask who am i he is quite sure who he is uh, he uh, he wanted some solution to the ethical problem he was facing what should he do but instead of directly answering that sri krishna goes to the highest philosophy to answer who am i from that he will then again come back to tell arjuna what he should do in life so first we must go to the core of the problem what am i to do in life do i know who i am say i am going to do something or not do something but who is this i that we must know first so this self realization that is the message of central message of vedanta and central message of bhagavad gita he starts 11th verse he says nanu shochanti panditha those who realize the self go beyond uh, sorrow here is echoing the upanishad um tarati shokam atmavit the knower of the self goes beyond sorrow goes beyond all suffering we all want that but we do not know the way to do that and the way to do that is self knowledge that is our subject this morning the first thing he tells arjuna the most reassuring thing is that we the real self is beyond death to go beyond death our real nature is beyond death so this is a huge thing because our one thing is certain whether we are whether god exists or not whether we are atman brahman whatever one thing we know that we are going to die death is certain later on krishna will tell arjuna jatasya hi dhruvo mrityu death is certain for those who are born now krishna tells arjuna the death is there for the body but you will not die because you are not the body you know mark twain the famous american author he said humorously he once remarked that it is not what we do not know that gets us into trouble it's that what we know that it just ain't so in americanism you know just ain't so uh, it is not so that idea that gets us into trouble we do not know that we are the atman we think no that's not possible i am just this body this is what is getting us into trouble and that's what uh, sri krishna attacks he attacks at that point that what is my conception of myself so he first starts with natve aham jatu nasam natvam neme janadhipa na chaiva na bhavishyama sarve vayamatah param this is the 12th verse he says that i did not exist at any time in the past not so you did not exist in the past not so all these kings you are seeing that they did not exist past means before this birth we think that we were born now and before that we did not exist no not so that is a wrong idea also after this birth when the body dies that is certain everybody knows but after this body dies we will not exist anymore not so 
So this is double negative. I was not there. No. You were not there earlier before this word. No. He is negating this common understanding of ourselves that we come into existence only at the birth and we go out of existence at death. This is due to the identification with the body. And Sri Krishna says, first of all, consider this. How can we understand this? Notice the body changes. This is the classic idea of the sixfold change. What Sri Krishna will first do in his teaching, the first teaching he gives to uh, Arjuna is to negate the sixfold changes. What is sixfold change? Um, asti, that the we are conceived in the mother's womb, we, um, we assume a body. And Jayate, we are born, second change, a big change. We are born as the newborn baby. Then Vardhate, the baby grows into a child, into a teenager, and then into a youth. And then matures, viparinamate, we reach a certain stage of maturity, middle age. Then, inevitably, a deterioration starts. Young people often don't understand. They think life will go on like this. But by the time you hit 40, 50, one notices, everything begins to deteriorate. You can manage it nicely. If you practice yoga, eat healthy, your health will be all right. But one notices that the kind of health and energy we had, the quick recovery that we had uh, when we were uh, 21 years old, that we don't have at 51, 61. <coughs> Viparinamate apakshiyate. There is a deterioration and this deterioration proceeds. And then finally, nashyati, death. And notice this has been a long time in coming. When the Yamadutas, the messengers of Yama come to take us to the other world and after death, we say we are not ready, we are not ready to die, we have got so many things and you did not give us some warning that it is time for us to depart. But Yama, the Lord of Death will say, we have given long warning to you. For, from your 40s onwards, hair is becoming thinner and grey, tooth is falling out, digestion is becoming poor, energy is not so much. Mental faculties slowly start uh, reducing. All these are warning signs. For what? Mrityuhu. That death of the body is coming. Sixfold changes. And here, Sri Krishna, he says, the sixfold changes are of the body. But you are not the body. How do we know that? He says, notice that you were the same. You cannot deny that the little uh, child, uh, the, the baby, you are that there in that baby's body. You have to deny, you have to say, you have to admit that I was there, I was that baby. And in the when the baby became a, a small child and teenager, I was that child, I was that teenager. And now, middle-aged person or elderly person, I am here in this body. The body has changed so much from birth and development and middle age, old age, body changes so much. Doctors tell us that every cell in the body is replaced by within a period of approximately seven years. There's nothing permanent about this body. Every cell is replaced. The body is the name of a stream of matter. And yet, in this continuously changing body, at every stage, we have to admit, I was there, I was there, I was there. The body changes and yet I am constant. If something is changing and something is unchanging, the two things cannot be the same. Changing, unchanging, two things cannot be the same. Simple, uh, simple uh, uh, you know, example is, suppose somebody is running and you try to catch hold of that running one. And then the result will be either, either I will be dragged along with that running person or that running person has to stop. If something is changing, I catch hold of that, I'll be forced to change. But I say, I am the same from babyhood till today. But the body has changed so much. Then am I literally the body? The uh, cha ever-changing body and the not changing self, I, they cannot be literally the same. Yes, body is there and changing. Yes, somehow I am associated with it. Somehow I am embodied here. 
but i am not literally exactly the body this is what sri krishna says in the next verse very famous verse where sri krishna compares the changing ages the development uh, maturation and deterioration of the body and these changes he compares and he says you are constant in all of them therefore when the final change comes the death of the body you will still remain constant just like it happened throughout life dehi no asmin yatha dehe kaumaram yovanam jara tatha dehantara prapti dhiras tatra namuhyati in this lifetime itself the body has changed dramatically uh, from birth childhood middle age youth middle age and old age and you admit you are the same you your same means body has changed but you are the one who was in that child's body you are the one who identified as the youth and the middle aged person and the old person so you are constant you are the same you have not changed your identity has not changed you are there in spite of the dramatic changes in the body therefore it comes one thing comes out that i cannot be the body literally be the body what is there but i am not literally the body because i admit i don't change and i admit body changes in that case the two must be somehow different and therefore he says when the final change comes in the body death don't think you have died because you are constant in a changing body one more change is death you remain constant you will still be there that is a beautiful insight that sri krishna um shares with arjuna here think about we never think about it we think death is there gone body is gone the person is also gone so when my body will die i will also die that's what i think but sri krishna says no one more point here he makes just as you looked at it as natural nothing to get worried about to you be happy when the baby becomes a child be happy when the child becomes a teenager the teenager becomes a youth you are happy it's natural so in the same way death is also not a terrible problem in fact for hindus we, we know that we have passed through many many lifetimes something that we have passed through so many lifetimes what is one more uh, death what is one the death of one more body why should we be so much worried he says o arjuna just as you were not worried in childhood became youth youth became middle age middle age became old age then don't worry that death will be the end death will also be one more change you will be constant dehantara prapti from one body to another body dhiras tatra namohyati the wise person the steady one the spiritual seeker is not shaken or at least should not be shaken so the death is nothing to be scared of because you will not die the physical body dies but you will not die there is a certain a little deeper reasoning we must think about why is it that we think that death is the end that um, the person does not exist anymore when we are dealing with a person and looking at a person a man or a woman or a child uh, we don't think we are dealing with a body only we think we are dealing with a conscious being somebody who is there uh, that body is there but through that body we are dealing with a person a conscious being a sentient being but when the body dies we say that being is also dead that person is also dead why because the death is the death of the body how are we sure that the conscious being is also dead how are we sure that sentient being the jiva that person is also dead so no but that person is not available anymore that is true if the instrument through which you are contacting that person that body the body is gone obviously the person cannot interact with you anymore so even when the body is in coma um, people think that a person is not there but there are many cases in medical cases that they have shown that conscious being is still there either even in the midst of coma internally aware or if not internally aware can i have come back into awareness from coma that means the person was still there we were unable to contact because the body is not functioning 
So we mix up the consciousness with the body. When we are, we are dealing with a conscious person, we say we are dealing with a conscious person, a sentient human being. We don't say we are dealing with flesh and blood and bones. But when that body, which is the vehicle of this conscious being, when that is destroyed, when that dies, we feel that conscious being is also gone. gone. If the um, car crashes, does it mean that the passenger is dead? No. So when the body dies, it is not a certainty that uh, the person is gone. The reason behind why we think in that way is we have this materialist idea that we, the conscious being, we are somehow being produced by the body. So if the body is not there, we will also not be there. That I am conscious, I am aware, I am this being Sarva Priyananda. Now the, the idea is that this body, this nervous system, this brain is producing Sarva Priyananda. Then when the body dies, nervous system, brain are destroyed. Then Sarva Priyananda also is destroyed, gone. But where is the connection between brain and Sarva Priyananda? This is called the hard problem of consciousness. If you Google it, you will find. Uh, in fact, the person who coined that term, hard problem of consciousness, David Chalmers, he's a professor here at New York University. What he wants to say is that, that when you examine the brain, you will find, last thing you will find is, the most subtle thing you will find is, subtle electrical activity in the neurons of the brain. That's it. You will never find consciousness. You will never find mind. How those electrical activities in the neurons, the elect neuronal activity, is connected to consciousness, there is some connection, no doubt, because they, there is correlation. But how it is connected, that nobody knows. And there is no way of finding out also. All the latest theories in consciousness studies, they have no explanation whatsoever how the brain is producing consciousness. So David Chalmers here is saying, is the brain at all producing consciousness? Or is consciousness using the brain in order to interact with the world? Maybe consciousness exists and it uses this living body mind as an instrument. There's a new theory they are proposing. It's an old theory, but it has been revived recently. It is called panpsychism. Panpsychism means mind and consciousness are existing and it uses the body. It's always there, but it is using the living body in order to manifest itself and to, to become active. And this is not from Gita. And this is from people who are materialistic. They say we are atheistic. We are not talking about religion, spirituality, but we are forced to this conclusion because we are unable to explain consciousness so far from, from brain activity. Therefore, the idea that if the brain is destroyed, consciousness will be destroyed, no. A person comes through the door. Shall we say that the door has produced the person? Not at all. The person leaves through the door. Shall we say now the person is gone, and the door has been destroyed? Our door is closed? No. Door was only the entry point for the person. Similarly, consciousness, it may be. Krishna is giving the possible. That maybe that the conscious being, you, Arjuna, I, Krishna, or all these kings, we are conscious beings. Not literally body. So we did not come into existence with the creation of the body. We will not go out of existence with the destruction of the body. This is one great idea that Krishna shares with Arjuna. Um, he gives this idea of the changing of the body, just like changing of the ages from childhood to youth to middle age. Also, later he gives another beautiful verse, Vasam Sijirnani Atha Vihaya, like changing old clothes. You put your old clothes in the laundry, put on a fresh set of clothes. Similarly, he says, as simple as that, when the Jivatma, uh, this body is no longer usable, you, the sentient being, you go on to another set, another new body, and you discard the old body. Just as you, as simply as you discard one set of clothes and you put on another set of clothes. So, two examples he has given to show that we are not the body. One is age, childhood, middle age, old age, and death. Another one is changing clothes. So, these two examples he shows we are nityam. Body is anityam. We do not come into existence with the existence of the body. We do not die with the death of the body. Next, 
something deeper. The 16th verse, Sri Krishna says here, Nasato vidyate bhavo, na bhavo vidyate sataha, ubhayorapi drishtanta, tvanayo sattvadarshibhi. The unreal has no existence and the real has no non-existence. The conclusion about both of this has been seen by the knowers of truth. This 16th verse of second chapter, one sadhu said, one Vedanta teacher, Ye to Gita ki hridaye hai, darshanik hridaye hai. This is the philosophical heart of the Bhagavad Gita. Why? Why is it so important? It is stating a very dramatic truth here. What he wants to say is, the Atma is truth. The body is not the truth. The Brahman alone is the truth. The world is an appearance. Brahma Satyam, Jagat Mithya. Atma Satyam, Jagat Mithya. You are Satyam. The world is an appearance. That's what he wants to say here. So very quickly, we'll run through the logic here. Um, he says that... Um, let, let me give an example before I go into what Sri Krishna is trying to say here. Things which are borrowed go away. What do I mean by that? A classic example is, suppose I'm cooking a potato. Water is boiling, the potato is being cooked there. The potato is hot, a hot potato. Now, if I ask the heat in the potato, does it belong to the potato? Is it always hot? No. The heat, it's because of the boiling water you put the potato in, it's hot. If you take it out after some time, it will become cold. That means the heat in the potato comes and goes. And the reason is it has been borrowed from the boiling water. Borrowed heat will come and go. The boiling water, is it naturally hot? Or is its heat borrowed? No, that is also borrowed. Water is not naturally hot. It is the pan, the saucepan, which is hot. And therefore, water is hot. After you take it outside and keep it, it will become cool after some time. Borrowed heat comes and goes. The pan, saucepan, is it naturally hot? No. It is hot because there is the fire underneath it. Uh, it is not intrinsically hot. Not naturally hot. It's borrowed. After some time you put it in the uh, cupboard, after some time you will see the saucepan has become cold. The fire underneath, is it naturally hot? Is it intrinsically hot? Or will it become cold after some time? No. As long as the fire exists, it is intrinsically hot. It is the very nature of fire to give heat. Uh, it is naturally hot. Notice, the heat of the fire no, never goes away. As long as there is fire, it is hot. Heat of saucepan goes away. Heat of the water goes away. Heat of the potato goes away. But heat of fire does not go away. It is because the potato and water and saucepan ultimately have borrowed their heat from the fire. It comes and goes. But uh, the heat of the fire is not borrowed. It does not come and go. It intrinsically always there. If a property is there intrinsically, it will always be there. If something is coming and going, it is not an intrinsic property of that thing. It is borrowed. So what? What is the connection? Notice that if you think of this existence itself, just existence, things exist. Now this existence, is it intrinsic, natural to a thing or is it borrowed? If it is borrowed, existence will come and go. Just like the heat of the, um, of the water or the saucepan or the potato, it will come and go. Coming and going of existence, another name is birth and death, creation and destruction. What is after all, when a child is born, we say they come into existence. What is that? It's birth. What is going out of existence? We say the person has died or the body is dead. It has gone out of existence. When things come into existence, we say they are born or created. When things go out of existence, we say they die and they are gone. This temporary nature of all things, body, world, a car, um, uh, a cookie, it, or even um, the planet or the star, all of them have beginning and end. Creation and destruction, birth and death. Before birth did not exist, after birth, death will not exist. 
all things in the world and they do so if things in the world are temporary they come into existence and they die they go out of existence we can can we say they get existence and lose existence if they get existence and lose existence then they are not naturally existing they are not intrinsically existing like the fire which has intrinsic heat these things do not have nothing in this world seems to have intrinsic existence this not having intrinsic existence is called falsity why it is borrowed existence another name for borrowed existence in advaita vedanta is falsity mithya so anything which has borrowed existence is mithya why that's the definition of mithya it's just like here in new york you don't know who is rich and who is not rich because people spend borrowed money credit credit card a bank will keep on giving you credit you can go on spending in broadway and then suddenly one day they will take away everything they will come and repossess everything borrowed richness borrowed wealth comes and goes quickly intrinsically rich person that will not go away so easily if it the problem with other people's money is they can take it away from you but your own money you cannot be taken similarly existence if existence is being taken away then it is not natural existence it is not intrinsic existence it has been borrowed from something else everything in the world anything that is temporary maybe lasting for billions of years like the galaxies but still it comes into existence goes out of existence rabindranath tagore in a beautiful poem uh, he says when a dry leaf falls from the tree into a pool uh, the ripples which are set out those same ripples go out among the suns and the stars of the universe the ripples of temporariness of uh, impermanence like one leaf falling from the tree and one star is dying after billions of years same temporary they all come into being and all go out of existence death is everywhere impermanence is everywhere this impermanence means borrowed existence borrowed existence means false mithya this is the meaning of jagat mithya when sri krishna says the unreal has no existence even though it seems to exist this world seems to exist because it has borrowed existence but it seems to exist it's borrowed existence there must be ultimately like fire has intrinsic heat they must have borrowed existence from something that has intrinsic existence that exists naturally you cannot have unending bottom of uh, bottomless well of borrowing at the ground there must be something that has intrinsic existence that has natural existence that will never go out of existence from that everything else has borrowed existence and uh, just like in a movie screen there are uh, there is the hero there is the villain there are cars and cops and robbers buildings and sky and earth all those are pictures they have borrowed their existence from the screen remove the screen it will go away so like this he says what is the screen here and here is the de- stunning revelation of krishna the screen is atma the underlying one which has intrinsic existence is atma atma satyam jagat mithya brahma satyam jagat mithya how do we know did you not just see earlier what i said nityam you exist continuously body comes and goes but you exist continuously if you exist continuously your existence is not coming and going just like the heat of the fire is not coming and going your existence is not coming and going that means it's a natural existence intrinsic existence your um this is in vedanta called sat pure being sat so your nature is this pure being you the atma which exists continuously in the birth of the body in the babyhood childhood teenage middle age old age death of the body you exist continuously your continuous existence proves existence is natural to you intrinsic to you your very nature is existence that name for that in upanishad is sat our nature nature of atma is sat this is a very important verse which says brahma satyam jagat mithya or atma satyam jagat mithya but this world seems to exist yes it borrows existence just like the potato borrows heat boiling water borrows heat 
saucepan borrows heat, but fire does not borrow heat. Similarly, everything in this world, body, mind, external world, from the stars and quasars to the quarks, they all have borrowed existence. Their names are different, the forms are different, functions are different, but their existence depends upon Atma, upon the one thing that exists continuously. So one, the nature of the Atma is existence, Sat. Moving on. This is very nice. Then I must know this Atma. Then Sri Krishna drops one more Vedantic bombshell. He says, Anashino Aprameyasya in the 18th verse. He says, yes, it is your, you will exist forever. You cannot be destroyed. There is no death for you. Death for the body, but not death for you. You are, then let me know this Atma. I am very interested now. Aprameya, it cannot be known. It cannot be known. Now, this is a shock. If it cannot be known, if the Atma cannot be known, then why start Bhagavad Gita? Why are you teaching self-knowledge, self-realization? You are saying it cannot be realized, it cannot be known, then why are you teaching it? Swami Vivekananda, he said the same thing in one lecture in, in London in, on Jnana Yoga. He says, it cannot be known, but you must not go away from here with the idea that it is unknowable. It is more than knowable. First, we know the Atma, we know ourselves, then we know anything else. It is more than known. First of all, why un unknowable? How do we know? We know through perception. We see, hear, smell, taste, touch. How do I know you are all there? I can see the screen of the computer. I can see your face. How do you know Swami is speaking? I can hear your words, Swami. So seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, these are instruments of knowledge. These are called pratyaksha sense perception and this is our source of knowledge we know atma fortunately unfortunately it cannot be seen it cannot be smelt tasted touched so heard it is beyond all the sense organs so sense organs cannot objectify yes but there is another way of knowing we do inference anumana we get data and on the basis of the data we come to an inference Lot of scientific knowledge is like that. We collect some data with our senses or instruments and then we come to some understanding. So can we not know the Atma that way? No. It is beyond Anumana. Because all Anumana, inference, is based on some sense data. You see something, then you make an inference. And then you learn something. But there is no sense data available for Atma. So it is beyond any kind of inference also. Yes, but Gita is telling us about Atma. Upanishad is telling us that is true. Shruti, Upanishad, Gita, these are the sources of knowledge about Atma. But they cannot directly reveal the Atma to us. Notice, after learning all this also, we cannot directly say, I have read the Gita, so now I know the Self. I am Self-realized. I am Atma Jnani, Brahma Jnani. We can't say that. After talking about Sat, Chit, Ananda, whatever you call it, Chidananda, Rupa, Shivoham, Shankaracharya sings. After listening to all that also, have you understood what the Atma is? Can you point out the Atma? No. I have got some idea about it. I have got some clarity about it. But I can't point it out. I can't directly uh, grasp the Atma. So even the Shruti, the Upanishads, Gita, can use words which are like pointers. It can point you in the right direction. It can uh, indicate to you the Atman, but then act Actually realizing you have to do by yourself. It is saying, see here, here is the Bhagavad Gita. But then if I just say, here is the Bhagavad Gita, those are just words. After that, you have to open your eyes and see by yourself. So the, the words, here is Gita, is not the experience of Gita. The experience of Gita is ultimately you hear the word and then you open your eyes and see the Gita. Then only you are experiencing Gita. Similarly, after the Upanishad, Bhagavad Gita, Krishna has told Arjuna, after hearing all that, we still have to self-realize that our own experience must be there. So, aprameya, inference cannot help us. Shruti can help us, but Shruti, the Upanishads, Gita, they can only indicate. And perception cannot reveal Atma to us. Aprameya, he says. It is, so, there is a deeper meaning to this. Why is it aprameya? Because it is not an object. 
See, there are many things in the world, physical things from the sun and the stars and galaxies to the tiny atoms and subatomic particles. There are mental things. Right now, when we look inside, thoughts, feelings, emotions, ideas, they're subtle, they're called sukshma. And these are also there, ideas and memories, and we all experience. But they are all objects, either gross physical things outside or subtle sukshma things in our mind. But they are all objects. And Atma is not an object. Only objects can be known. The Atma is not an object, therefore it cannot be known. That uh, interesting story of the tenth man. I love that story. So that is often used to, uh, to teach the truth about Vedanta. Vidyarnya Swami in his book Panchadashi, he uses that story in detail to show how Vedanta works. We know the story of the tenth man. The ten friends went to a journey, on a journey and they crossed the river. Then one of them thought, have we all crossed or did somebody drown? Let's count. And he counted. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Where is the tenth one? Oh, tenth one must have drowned. So he counted everybody else except himself. And he thought only nine are there. So the tenth one is drowned. They were crying. When the wise man came and told them, no, no, tenth man is there. You count. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Ten. Dashramastvamasi. You are the tenth. And then they were happy. But why did he why did he miss himself? Why did he not count himself? He could not find the tenth one because he was not counting himself. But the question is, why was he not counting himself? He has a very good reason for not counting himself. The reason is this. All the other nine, where did he find those nine people? Outside. Object. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Therefore, he has a good reason to suspect tenth one should be there. Nine are there, so the tenth one also should be there. But the tenth one is not an object. Tenth one is he himself the subject. So the tenth one is different from the other nine. That's why he could not find. Similarly, the Atma is not an object. It's not the body, not the prana, not the uh, mind, and not the intellect, not even the anandamaya. You know, pancha kosha, pancha kosha vilakshana atma. Annamaya, pranamaya, manomaya, vijnanamaya, anandamaya. They are all objects. But who are the objects to? Who is experiencing body, mind, intellect? Consciousness, the atma itself. So atma is not an object. That's why aprameya, it cannot be objectified. That's what Krishna is telling. Arjuna wants to know, where is the Atma? You can't find it that way. The way you are looking, if you open your eyes, you will only see Kurukshetra. If you close your eyes, you will only see your own thoughts. Arjuna is thinking, I'm so sad. So only so sad thought will be there. Neither by opening eyes nor by closing eyes, you can see the Atma. Then which is the Atma? The one which is ex having the experience of the external world of the internal world, that pure subject, consciousness, that is the Atma. If it is unknowable, then how will we ever know? It is not unknowable, but it is not knowable as the object. It is knowable as the subject. Good example is our own eyes. We see all this, the whole world right now we are seeing because of the eyes, but we can't see the eyes. We can't see our own eyes. You may say, just look at a uh, mirror, Swami, you can see your own eyes. But that's a reflection of my eyes. The way the eyes are directly seeing the world, that way the eyes cannot see themselves. Even now, when I look at a picture, when I look at the camera and I look into the camera like this to see my eyes, I'm seeing a picture of my eyes. It is going to the camera and coming out through the screen. <coughs> that's not my eyes directly. So the eyes which are seeing the world cannot see themselves. And in philosophy, this is the rule of self-reflexivity. A thing does not operate on itself. A knife cannot cut itself. Similarly, the eyes cannot see themselves. The subject cannot objectify itself. Sri Krishna says, aprameya. So, O Arjuna, your real nature is aprameya, but it is knowable because it is consciousness. It is because it is consciousness, everything is revealed to you. Just because the eyes are there, I can see everything. Just by seeing everything, I know my eyes are there. How do I know why my eyes are open? Because I can see. Notice the interesting thing. If you see something, it is the proof of the existence of that thing. The proof of the existence of glasses is this one. 
I can see the glasses here. Oh, yes, it is there. The proof of the existence of Gita book is I can see the Gita book. It is there. If I see the Gita, it's not the proof of existence of glasses. If I see the glasses, it's not the proof of existence of uh, a Gita. But in both cases, one thing is proved. I have got eyes. If I see the glasses, I know I have eyes are working. Eyes are working. If I see the Gita, I know I have eyes are working. Similarly, what is the proof of the Atma? What is the proof that you are conscious? By being conscious of what? By being conscious of anything, it is proved that I am conscious. By experiencing anything, whatever you see, people, places, thoughts, emotions, even blankness. Blankness is also an experience. Every experience proves to you that you are consciousness. Every experience. Just as seeing anything proves to me that eyes are there, just by the fact of seeing, Similarly, the fact of experience, what experience? Seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, thinking, remembering, enjoyment, suffering, all of that proves I am consciousness, 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 constant consciousness. This constant consciousness which is revealed to me in every experience of life, this is in Vedanta called Chit, Chit, Chaitanya, Bodha. Samvit, Chiti, many, many names are there for this. This consciousness is Atma. Earlier we got Sat, continuous existence, intrinsic existence. Sat is Atma. Now we are getting Chit is Atma. This continuous existence consciousness, it objectifies, it illumines not only the body, but also the mind. And not that just the body dies, the mind is also continuously changing. The body is changing continuously, mind is changing continuously. They are all revealed to this constantly existing Sat and Chit. The Chit reveals everything and the Sat gives existence to everything. Just like the fire gives heat to everything else, you the Sat, you the pure being, you give existence to mind, body and the universe. What a radical idea. Materialist idea is matter exists and it is out of charity, giving existence to a sentient beings. Vedanta reverses it. You exist and your existence is giving existence to everything in the world. You are aware. Your awareness is illuminating the world. Upanishad says, Tameva bhantam manubhati sarvam. That shining, everything else shines. Tasya bhasa sarvam idam vibhati. By its light, everything here shines. Everything is illumined here. You shining, everything else shines. Everything else means you, the consciousness shining, mind shines with your consciousness. The senses are now lit up. With the mind and senses, the world is revealed to me. So you shining, everything else shines. This is the conclusion from the one word, aprameya, not an object. If it's aprameya, not an object, and yet it is always revealing, another word is svaprakasha. You are self-luminous. So this sat-chit, and the infinite nature of this Sat Chit is Ananda. Sri Krishna says this, this Atma, which is Sat Chit Ananda of the Upanishads, in the 19th verse, he says, This Atma, Yainam Vetti Hantaram, Yaschainam Manyate Hatam, Ubhautauna Vijanito. Nayam hanti na hanyate. He who thinks this self to be a slayer and he who thinks it is slain, both are ignorant of the truth. It, the self ne neither slays nor is slain. So why this talk about slayer and slaying, killing and killed? Because it's a battlefield. So that example he is giving, Krishna. If you think you are doing any action like killing, you don't know. You think that somebody is killing you or doing something to you. You don't know the self. Um, the great American poet Emerson and writer, essayist, uh, writer, poet, uh, in his poem, Brahma, I think. So he, he wrote, when the red slayer thinks he slays or is slain, he knows, knows not. 
the deep ways. So the literally he's translating from this, but also from Kathopanishad actually. So um, he incorporated in his poem that neither slayer nor slain. This is the nature of the self. Uh, Emerson was very interested in Vedanta. And at that time, Emerson, Walt Whitman, uh, Thoreau. So uh, Thoreau actually got books on Vedanta from Emerson. And um, Thoreau, he writes that early in the morning, I wake up and read a few pages of Bhagavad Gita. And uh, he says, I am bathed in the light of the dawn of civilization, in a purer light. Beginning of civilization is this Bhagavad Gita. Uh, of course, at that time, people did not like it very much here. Emerson gave a talk in, at Harvard University, where he had put many Vedantic ideas in that talk. And he was immediately banned from Harvard University for 30 years. But uh, he became America's leading philosopher and essayist. And, and so, of course, Harvard could not reject him. Finally, they invited him back again. And now the philosophy department in Harvard University is called Emerson Hall. <laughs> so, what is the meaning of the slayer, slain, not slayer, not slain? It means you are not karta or bhokta. The atma, sat and chit is not the doer of actions nor the enjoyer or sufferer of the results of actions. You are pure consciousness. You being there, you shining, the mind is lit up by consciousness and the mind being lit up, the sense organs and motor organs are lit up by consciousness and with the, this consciousness itself, you yourself, with the mind and with the sensory system, with the body, you are the doer of actions and the experiencer of the results of actions. Bhokkar, katta, bhokta. But by yourself, Atma itself is not a doer or uh, experiencer of the results of actions. Why is he saying this? This means we are free of the law of karma. What is the law of karma? Good, good. If you do dharma, your result will be punya. The result of punya is sukha. Do good, you will get merit. The result of merit is you will have a pleasant life. Do bad, consciously if you are mischievous, adharma. The result of adharma is papa. And the result of papa is dukkha. This is the law of karma. Swami Vivekananda says, good, good, bad, bad. And none escape the law. Whosoever wears the form, wears the chain too. Form means body. As whenever we have a body, we are under the result. We are under the influence of past karma, prarabdha karma. So as long as that karma is giving results, we have this body. And we will have pleasant and unpleasant experiences. These pleasant and unpleasant experiences, um, they come from our past karma. Good, good, bad, bad. Then what is Vedanta? If everything is determined by past karma, what does Vedanta do for us? What is Krishna teaching here? Swami Vivekananda says in that same poem, far beyond name and form is Atman ever free. No, thou art that sannyasi bold, say Om, Tat Sat, Om. So this Atma is free of karma. Na karta, na bhokta, na hanyate, hanyamane sharire. Krishna says here to Arjuna that you are not the doer of the actions ultimately. Atma is not the doer of the actions. Atma is not the sufferer of the consequences of actions. Karma and karma phala, you as Atma, you are always free of it. Body is not free of karma. Mind is also not free of past karma. But you the Atma, the drashta, the witness, you are always free of karma. This is the self that Krishna teaches in the beginning of Bhagavad Gita. You are eternal. You are already eternal. You don't have to worry about acquiring immortality. You are that already. And not only that, you are the reality. You satyam jagat mithya. <laughs> you are the reality. The world is an appearance. How can you say such a bold thing? Because of your continuous existence, it shows Existence is intrinsic to you, not borrowed. And the world comes and goes. That means existence is borrowed by the world. The world is mithya, you are satyam. And then you are not an object. Atma is not an object. Aprameya. But it is the revealer, the illuminer of all objects, external and internal, world and mind. And finally, you are free of the law of karma. Good, good, bad, bad. 
does not apply to you. When we realize who we are, we get freedom from the law of karma. In Hinduism, Buddhism, Jainism, Sikhism, this is known as moksha. This is known as freedom. This is the result of self, self-realization. Tameva viditva ati mrityumeti. Realizing this, I am. Realizing this, ahameva, uh, uh, ahameva brahma. Aham brahma asmi. I am this Brahman. I am this Atman. This kind of realization sets us free from uh, suffering from the cycle of birth and death. We attain the goal of life, moksha. What are the sadhanas for it? Sri Krishna will explain more. We will see in the upcoming lectures. Basically, the sadhana is that this teaching must be heard. It must be reflected upon properly. And then after hearing and reflection, stay with it in meditation. Shravana, Manana, Nididhyasana. Hear, reflect and assimilate it through meditation. It becomes a living knowledge which will set us free. All the associated sadhanas which which is necessary, Sri Krishna will tell in the remaining chapters, 17 chapters which are remaining Bhagavad Gita, he will talk about everything that is necessary. But this is the central teaching. This is the first teaching and the last teaching. Know yourself and be free. Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tat Sat Shri Ram Krishna Rupanamastu Do we have time for some short question answer session? Uh, yes, uh, Swamiji, I think so. Um, thank you, Swamiji, for this enlightening, impactful talk. Um, I'll just post the questions to you uh, that have been raised by the audience. The first one um, is, um, as you have mentioned in many talks and also given in Kathopanishad, how does one protect oneself from a racer's edge? One Mr. Sriram has posed this question. Razor's edge. Uh, that is a quotation from Kathopanishad. Shurasya dhara, nishita durasya. That this spiritual path is the razor's edge. Razor's edge at every level. Razor's edge, you know, it is very sharp. If you step on it by mistake, you will cut your feet. But you have to walk on it. This is just like walking on a razor's edge. So, it is so difficult and sharp. But, how do you protect yourself? First of all, what is the danger? Danger is at every level. Um, at first of all, at the basic moral level. If we constantly keep slipping away from morality, if I do not stick to the truth and I tell lies, if I um, am not satisfied with what I get honestly and I cheat or take bribes, if I am not peaceful, non-violent, if I go and hurt other people, violent, harmful to other people, This moral failings, this is the first blow of the razor. No chance of getting um, enlightenment. We must stick to a moral path. We may have have done anything in the past. That is not the big thing. That we can confess, we can make, make up for what we have done. And most important, promise not to do it again. But then sticking to moral life is the first protection. Second protection is uh, the the focus, the desires in the heart which constantly pull us out towards the world. Why do people do wrong things? See, Arjuna will ask Krishna, Atakena prayuktoyam papam charati purusha anichanapi vashneya baladiva niyojita Forced by what does a person uh, do sinful things? Not willing to do sinful things also, but to still do wrong things. Why? And Sri Krishna says, Kama esha krodha esha, rajaguna samudbhava. Basically, desires in the mind, they force us, even though not willing, but I want something so much. Either desire or fear. There's terror or temptation. Temptation or terror. Both of these things make us do wrong things. Um, tell lies. So, desire has to be tackled. Vasana. If that fo- is flowing towards the world, then it has to be channeled towards God. That which is of the form, I want what? World. Many things in the world. A person, uh, uh, objects, wealth, power, or even Facebook likes. 
<laughs> so all of that i want that wanting things in the world has to be replaced by the same i want but instead of world i put god i want krishna not the world world will be there my duty has to be done i will be active in the world whatever has to be done i will be able to live much better when i am not grasping at things in the world for my personal benefit then my life will become a benefit for others also and it will be a blessing for me so second level of protecting yourself from that razor's edge is bhakti is devotion to god which is wanting god not wanting the world um one sadhu uh, ram sukhdas ji he said i'm paraphrasing jagat ko chahoge to dukh anivarya hai if you want the world i want pleasure from the world from the people in the world objects in the world activities in the world then the suffering also you have to take it will come together with it if you want freedom from suffering and true fulfillment not temporarily little little pleasures they're like like itching the that freedom from suffering and deep satisfaction you have to let go of desires for the world and that same desire will now be directed to god and you will be fulfilled you will be happy then the third level of protection is the focus our mind is so scattered it goes here and there and that is the cut of the razor so focus not distraction dhyana meditation and krishna will teach arjuna in sixth chapter final level of protection is atma not anatma i am the self the, the self realization not continuously holding on to body mind as the self the more we hold on to body mind as self the razor will cut the more we let go of body mind as self i am the witness consciousness i'll be safe from the razor jnana dhyana bhakti karma karma yoga these are protections from the razor edge thank you swami ji the next question is um true our body changes from birth to old age but our mind <coughs> changes as well our awareness changes as well so mind awareness and body are not the same would that be fair to say correct body is changing we talked about it mind changes even more every day and right now mind is changing so much so i am the one who is the witness of changing body changing mind but awareness does not change so no no swami ji awareness changes uh, early in the morning uh, i am sleepy after a cup of coffee my awareness is so clear uh, so awareness is changing no that is the mind the sharpness alertness the quality of mind sleepiness dullness quality of mind awareness is constant everywhere i am aware of sharp mind i'm aware of alert mind i'm aware of sleepy mind i'm aware of dull mind so mind changes body changes world of course changes but consciousness is constant consciousness awareness bodha whatever you call it is constant um so this this is what i wanted to say yeah uh, the next one is a very long question um dictionary says realization is the process of becoming aware of something or mm. the process of achieving a particular aim etc what mm. exactly is self realization is it self- remembering something mm. we forgot or gaining some new wisdom also mm. the weird atma seems to be used in very many meanings does not this lead to confusion in understanding what the atma vidya really entails nyaya philosophers talk about 12 prameyas atma to the 12th one apavarga could you elaborate on the differences between idea of atma in gita and nyaya shastras this Good. is question so this is actually many questions are there yes. uh, so let's start from the beginning what was the first two lines he, uh, he said um the process of be- uh, what exactly is self realization is it remembering uh, something right. for god or gaining some new wisdom thank you the question is actually good it's many things are packed into this question first question is what is self when i say self realization is it uh, acquiring a new knowledge or is it remembering something that we have forgotten so according to advaita vedanta we are the atma and it is one atma actually we are not separate atmas uh, we are atma and we do not know it 
not knowing it is called agyana or ignorance knowing it is called jnana or knowledge ignorance is the problem knowledge is the solution so are we gaining are we becoming atma self realization is becoming the atma no we are already the atma whether you know it or not one sadhu in uttarakhand in gangotri he would teach this ashtavakra and he would say to us tum jano ya na jano mano ya na mano tum hi ram you know it or you do not know it you accept it or you don't accept it but you are rama you are god <laughs> so <laughs> we are already that but we don't know it so we are gaining a new knowledge now is it just knowledge i can gain lot of different kinds of knowledge i can read a book on philosophy and gain some knowledge i can gain i did not know something about biology i can read a biology book or a mathematics book and know something about biology mathematics so is it like that yes and no first of all we are gaining new knowledge no doubt but because it is about myself my whole self concept changes so when it becomes a living change then uh, it is uh, realization it should not remain just as a kind of uh, one corner of the intellect i have understood some nice philosophical thing in gita that's it no if i say i have understood what is the atma i understood sat chit ananda you are saying swami ji all these things i understand i am the satyam jagat is mithya but then um, now what do i have to do what do i i have to do means who are you i am sarva priyananda then you have not changed because i was taught if you could say honestly i am satchidananda then the work is done like shankaracharya he says chidananda rupa shivoham if he says that i have read all vedanta but i am shankara now what else to do then you have not read vedanta you have not understood after reading vedanta if you come to the conclusion chidananda rupa shivoham your problems are solved that is realization but the first stage is necessary we must read we must also understand intellectually also definitely that deepens into realization only when i can honestly say just like i feel right now i am sarva priyananda and that time i will i i say um, chidananda rupa shivoham aham brahmasmi i can honestly say that in that case you have got realization now is it new wisdom yes it is new wisdom of this type the vivid direct realization living realization like i feel i am sarva priyananda now then i should clearly see i am brahman i am atman is it remembering something forgotten earlier uh, not in advaita vedanta but in kashmiri shaivism the whole philosophy pratyavigya philosophy so it is recognition not remembering remembering means what you know that it was something was there now i remember it but atma is not something in the past atma is now so remembering is not correct recognition may be another a better word when you see you meet a person whom you had known in the past then you had forgotten now you see for the after many years what do you do i recognize this person in in front of you present i am recognizing atma is always there i have forgotten no doubt but when i now remember it's not just remembering remembering always refers to past but it is something present so i will you remember yes but i will recognize this is called pratyavigya not advaita vedanta does not accept this but kashmiri shaivism says this is the nature of realization then the next two lines the next two lines is nyaya philosophers talk <coughs> about 12 prameyas atma hmm. to apavarga could you elaborate on the differences between idea of atma in gita and nyaya shastras so uh, there are multiple philosophies within hinduism nyaya vaisheshika sankhya yoga purva mimamsa and what we call vedanta gita is a book of vedanta now the nyaya idea is also correct but from vedantic perspective it will be incomplete in nyaya what they say is we are the atma but we need to know whatever is knowable prameyas those things have to be known as the anatma then we will realize who we are the atma and will be free so yes in that to that extent nyaya matches with vedanta but it does not match in some other respects why nyaya says atma is many each of a separate atma vedanta dis- disagrees that atma so nyaya says atma is many sankhya says atma is many yoga philosophy says atma is many but um, uh, vedanta says bodies are many minds are also many jivatmas are also many 
But Paramatma, Brahman, the ultimate reality, Satchidananda is one. So that's one big difference. Um, Nyaya also agrees, Paramatma is one. But in Nyaya, the Paramatma is Ishwara, somebody different from you. Also, Nyaya is a Bheda Darshana. Bheda means difference is still there ultimately. In Advaita Vedanta, difference, Bheda, is an appearance. Abheda, non-duality, uh, uh, non-difference is the ultimate reality. Oneness, yes, that's a better way of putting it. Oneness is the teaching of Vedanta. Oneness is also teaching of Bhagavad Gita. So there are many philosophical differences between the Nyaya idea of Atma and the Vedantic idea of uh, Atma. Okay, the next question is, if we are freed from karma, <coughs> does it not open up opportunities to do anything, even immoral things? No, this doing everything. I can do immoral things if I want, but I want. That means vasana is there. That is what is pushing me to do immoral things. But one who has realized the Atma, what vasana will be there for that, that person? Vasana means desires. Desires are there in the mind. And they are there only because we think we are this little body mind. I need all these things from the world. All very attractive things. Then I must be a greedy fellow and dishonest fellow in trying to get those things. I am afraid of so many things in the world. Disease is there. Death is there. Dishonor is there, um, critical people are there, insult is there. I'm afraid of all of that. So I must avoid it, even tell lies in order to avoid trouble. So immoral things we do uh, because of fear or, or desire. But from if I am the infinite Atman, I am every I am one with all, all are one with me. I have no death, I have no nothing to gain from this world. I am ever fulfilled, Purnam. Why will I do anything wrong? There, where is the motive for doing anything wrong at all? Okay. So, there will not be any desire to violate the law of karma for a Jivan Mukta. See, we follow the law of karma because we are afraid of the consequences. We follow the law of karma, may not be afraid. We are trying to be good people. We are trying to do good. We are trying to avoid the bad. We are sadhaka, we are trying. But the siddha, the enlightened one, does not have to try. They are naturally good. Their very nature is expressed as a moral life, ethical life. Yeah, the next one is, after the body dies, what happens to the I or what happens to me? Yes, after the body dies, the jivatma transmigrates. That is, um, utkramana it is called. It goes from this body, goes to other experiences and finally takes another body. So what is the Jivatma? It is the Atma plus or limited by the Sukshma Sharira. I am using just Sukshma Sharira. Actually, there is Sukshma Sharira and Karan Sharira also. What is Sukshma Sharira? Mana, Buddhi, Chitta, Ahankara, the five powers of the senses, Pancha, Gyanindriya. The five powers, not the physical senses, the powers behind it. The five powers of the motor organs. Karma Indriya, uh, the five pranas. So I have given 19. Five Karma Indriya, the power only, not the physical um, uh, Indriyas. Five Karma Indriya, five Gyan Indriya, five pranas, that is 15. Mana Buddhi Chitta Ahankara, 19. All of this together is called Sukshma Sharira, subtle body. This one will continue. It's also a vehicle, it is not the Atma. This one will continue. Atma is reflected in it as the reflected consciousness, Chidavasa. So it, you have to read a little bit about the Vedantic cosmology to understand this. Basically, Jivatma travels from lifetime to lifetime. Krishna says, Jatasya hi dhruvo mrityu, dhruvam janma mritasya cha. It is true that anybody who is born will die because the body will die. But the, after the death of the body, the subtle body, Jivatma, con consciousness plus the subtle body, the subtle body will continue and it will get new bodies. That's what happens to us after death. Okay. Then um, for verses 10 to 25 of chapter 2, Krishna asks Arjuna to shake self-delusion, introduces the self. How do we as grihasthas of today perform dharma as a spouse, colleague, but apply the self-concept in day-to-day? -day? Yes. 
Notice something. Krishna is not a monk. Uh, he is a householder. Arjuna is not a monk. He is a householder. And after the teaching of Bhagavad Gita also, neither Krishna nor Arjuna becomes a monk. They remain as householder. So they are doing their duty. In fact, Krishna to- tells Arjuna to remain as householder. If you read carefully, Arjuna at one point is suggesting, I will run away from this and become a monk. Bhikshacharyam charan. That means, I will go and live on arms. I don't want to any part of this mess, this Kurukshetra. After teaching all this to Arjuna, the self-knowledge, then Krishna advises him, if you want to realize this, you still have to do your duty. You have to be in the middle of this. It is for householders, not only for sannyasis, sannyasis only secondarily. This is primarily a teaching for householders. It is entirely practical. Gita is entirely practical. If you want practical spirituality, best is Bhagavad Gita. So how to do it? Um, Krishna will talk in the next few verses after 25th verse. Karma Yoga. How to spiritualize day-to-day activities. Which day-to-day activity? Remember, Arjuna is telling Arjuna, battlefield. Worst kind of activity in life is war. You know, like what is going on in Ukraine. In the middle of that, can you be spiritual? Krishna says, yes, you can be. So in the middle of business, you can be spiritual. In the middle of education and health care, in the middle of, um, um, if you're a bureaucrat or whatever, in politics, in whichever field we are, we can be spiritual. And at home, in the community, we can and we should be spiritual. So first of all, I am the Atma. And then the practice of those three things, Karma Yoga, Bhakti Yoga, and dhyana, dhyana yoga. Those are the three things we must keep on doing in our lives. Okay. Uh, the next question <coughs> is, if experience itself proves the existence of consciousness, does consciousness always require an object? What happens when thoughts are eliminated? Vritti nirodha. Yeah. So, subtle question. So, it seems that Um, we are continuously engrossed in this external world. Now, by the teaching of Vedanta, we become aware, oh, not only external world, not only the mind, but I am awareness, which is experiencing mind and external world. Good. Now I become aware of awareness. Very good. But to become aware of awareness, you need the external world. It's only because I'm seeing, I'm aware of the eyes. It's only because I'm seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, I am aware that I am aware. Suppose there was no seeing, no hearing, no smelling, no t- tasting, touching. Would I still exist? Yes, I cannot see, but I will exist as a blind person. I am thinking. The, suppose thought also stops. Would I still exist? Yes, I will exist as a blind person and thoughtless person. Awareness will continue. Only thing is, you cannot express it Without thinking and without a body and a mind, no body mind. So awareness continues regardless. In order to express it or to manifest it, you require body mind. One person may say that in that case, awareness, atma depends on the world it's for some reason at least. At least for manifestation or for self awareness, we depend on the world. It is not independent reality. Yes, if you think in that way, then in Sankhya philosophy. Atma or Purusha and Prakriti, they interact and they depend. Uh, Purusha depends on Prakriti for all activity and Prakriti depends on Purusha for consciousness, for illumination. But remember in Vedanta, unlike Sankhya, this Prakriti, this Maya, the external world is your appearance. Notice we read, you are the source, like the fire which is giving heat. The heat of the saucepan and the boiling water and the potato, all is the fire seat only. Similarly, this external world, all the objects which we are using to become self aware also, their existence also depends upon me. The external world does not exist apart from the Atman. The internal world does not exist apart from the Atman. So when you say consciousness or awareness depends on an object, it does not matter because that object is also nothing other than consciousness itself appearing as its own object. It's not a separate entity. In Nyaya, Vaisheshika, Sankhya, Yoga, the object is a separate entity apart from Atma. In Vedanta, Advaita Vedanta, the object is an appearance to the Atma, in the Atma, 
as nothing but the atma advaita yeah. okay um can we see vivekananda through our naked eyes by meditations and sadhanas well you can i have actually heard of people who have had the vision of swami vivekananda swami vivekananda said before he passed away he said he passed on the 4th of july 1902 he used to say i will not live to see 40 he passed at the age of 39 that's why he is uh, you know the national youth icon in india his birthday is the national youth day now before passing away he said it may be that i shall see fit to discard this body but i shall not cease working i shall inspire people everywhere all human beings everywhere until they the, until the whole universe knows it is one with god so he is there and inspiring arobindo rishi arobindo said what we know of vivekananda the spiritual power the life he led and what he has accomplished only tiny fraction of that that power has not gone from the world that power is still there visibly you can't see because the body is gone but through sadhana one can have direct experience of vivekananda one way of directly experiencing right now is to read vivekananda vivekananda lives he said i shall be a voice without a form the form has died body but the voice is there the voice is in all the the complete works of vivekananda read raja yoga read bhakti yoga read gyana yoga karma yoga by swami vivekananda his letters letters of swami vivekananda the talks with the disciple conversation question answers with his disciple sharad chandra chakravarti inspired talks so these books if you read you are going to meet vivekananda sure um how can we, we wrap tell... it up now i think it's 8:30 should we uh, let's okay let's take one more question and then we will wrap it up okay. we can keep the questions for next time then all right so this would be the last question i'm sorry if i have let some uh, left some of the questions but due to lack of time we have to keep this as the last one um how can we tell that the jeevaatma has left the body when the person being in the hospital for 3 weeks and doctors want family members to decide whether to remove the life sustaining machines right we it's um, i mean if the body is dead then the jeevaatma has left the body but if medically body is still alive then jeevaatma is there now the thing is should we remove life support or not from a vedantic perspective there is no problem jeevaatma the body is like a vehicle for the jeevaatma vehicle for what for the spiritual journey in in um kathopanishad the image of the chariot is used atmanam ratinam vidhi shariram ratham evatu mana pragrahavan so he says the body is like a chariot atma is like the passenger in the chariot the horses are like the senses Uh, the sense objects are like the road on which the horse is running the bridle with which the horses are controlled is the mind the driver charioteer is intellect buddhi now if all of them have collapsed the body is the, the chariot is old now not working then the passenger will change the chariot will go to another chariot similarly when the body is not working anymore it cannot support the jeevaatma in the body anymore then the jeevaatma will take another body therefore Uh, if the body is not functional surely medically cannot be recovered if the doctors recommend and if the patient's relatives agree you should let let that person go the jeevaatma is not harmed at all and you will be it's a blessing because the jeevaatma will be able to take on a new body again and progress further in spiritual life often out of our own emotion we try to hold on but are we not prolonging the suffering Uh, of that person of the jeevaatma thank you swami ji for your patience and uh, your unambiguous clarification provided for all the questions raised i would also like to thank the heb hab participating organizations the audience and the team members for their presence today and support the online session for the third quarter of the lecture series is scheduled on saturday 3rd september 2022 we are happy to inform that swami ji will be coming to singapore in december to deliver the final lecture of the series in person thanks again to one and all for making this program successful satisfactory and highly valuable now over to sunil ji for the concluding prayers
ഓം വസുദേവസുതം ദേവം കംസാണൂരമർദ്ദനം ദേവകീ പരമാനന്ദം കൃഷ്ണം വന്ദേ ജഗദ്ഗുരും സർവേ ഭവന്തു സുഖിന സർവേ സന്തു നിരാമയാ സർവേ ഭദ്രാണി പശ്യന്തു മാ കശ്ചിത് ദുഃഖഭാഗ് ഭവേത് ഓം പൂർണമത പൂർണമിതം പൂർണ ആത്പൂർണമുദക്ഷ്യത് പൂർണ്ണ പൂർണമാതായ പൂർണമേവശിഷ്യത്തെ ഓം ശാന്തി 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 ഹരി ഓം ശ്രീ ഗുരുഭ്യോ നമ ഹരി ഓം താങ്ക് യു is there a program of taking a picture yes so many yes so many yes uh-huh. so we should all stay with the camera on i think yes you can only enable your videos one more thing announcement uh, i think uh, she has forgotten uh, the upcoming uh, major event is uh, the gita haban which is happening on the 31st of uh, july uh, on uh, sunday uh, as usual uh, it is a physical event happening at the pgp hall <coughs> with garbadi homam starting at 7 o'clock and with, uh, with uh, krishna puja ahuti for all the 700 shlokas of uh, the gita uh, on multiple homakundas purna ahuti uh, abhishekam puja maharati prasadam etc so all of you are welcome uh, so please do come and um, enjoy the uh, gita haban highly auspicious event So anybody has anything else, Srinivasanji? Want to say anything? Uh, All right. Then I think we are finished. All right then. It's wonderful to have been here with all of you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Swami. It is fantastic. Beautiful. Until next time, yes. Take care. Stay safe. Thank you so much.